Ladies and gentlemen, very excited to be joined with our next guest, Mr. John Chalice. Hello. How do you do? Very good, thank you. How are you? Well, uh, no, I'm fine. Just got here in, uh, in Bath at the Comedia Theatre. Bit of a drive. We've just been in uh, Dorset. And uh, last night, where were we last night? What were we doing last night? I know, I was doing my show, the show I'm going to do here. What I was going to do it at a particular venue, which was called Weymouth. The Riviera Theatre in Wales. And that was a, an extraordinary experience, I have to say. It was a wonderful, um, wonderful hotel there, and uh, sort of built in about 1937. And I was actually playing sort of a lounge thing in the corner of a lounge. And uh, it used to be a holiday camp, it used to be a content holiday camp. So very different from uh, from here. But this is very familiar. Well, parts of it are quite familiar to me because uh, my mother was born in Bath. So I spent a lot of time down here as a kid in Bath, and uh, I remember coming here when I was at the Bonash Cinema. When I was very young, sneaking off at the Bonash Cinema. So, uh, it's nice to be back. And it's the last day. Yeah, my last, last day of the tour. Yeah, um, this year. And I've been to next year, I've got uh, lots of problems already. So when you, when you did the show, um, and this hundreds of people turned up, do you ever get surprised with how many people uh, come to the show? Uh, well, I know, I know a lot of people love, love, the, love uh, any horses and horses and so on, other stuff I've done, you know, but uh, I'm always amazed that, you know, it's been going, I've been doing it for about five years now. Yeah. So I'm so amazed that people still turn up. Some people come sort of two or three times, and so I always feel I've got to do it slightly different. And uh, the game show is slightly different. Uh, as you know, I've got so many stories and so many things I can talk about. I know what works well and what people uh, would like to listen to. In case it's something else goes through, so I wander off and look at the table and I don't know how to bring myself back. What I think is fantastic is you, you see a lot of actors who have played a character on a TV show and they, they, they want to shy away from it almost. So, so they don't like to be associated with a character, they don't really like to talk about it. You really have embraced Boise in, in many ways. You go to the conventions with, with other things you do, shows, shows like this. And you, you live the character as well, it's what people love. So do you find that that helps you to bring an audience like this, the fact that you live that character and you... Well, yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, I, I keep hearing about other actors who, as they say, uh, they don't want to talk about stuff they've done in the past because they want to create something different. But uh, I don't think, uh, actually, we've got any choice. Because, I mean, we've talked about it. And, uh, I remember when, when we were doing it, saying, whatever else we do, However good we are at the National Theatre, the one shots we come from, the television character. This is the most famous thing we've ever done. And it's true, it, it was. I'm uh, talking to Roger Lloyd Pack, who's sadly no longer with us, uh, no trigger. And uh, he took the, the whole business um, very seriously, a lot more seriously than I do. And he did a lot of terrific stuff. I mean, all in the all sorts of stuff. But uh, people just wanted to call him Trigger, like they called me Boise, Del Boy, Rodney, whatever you do, you know, people say, I've just done um, the new series of Benidorm, a bit different character, and um, a very different sort of role, you know, and out there, there are an awful lot of early Fools and Horses fans, saying, hello Boise, and I'm going, no, I'm not Boise anymore, oh no, you'll always be Boise, <laughs> You know, that's how it is. So um, it, it occurred to me that if it gives people pleasure and gives them uh, gives them joy, which it does, who am I to say, I'm oh, sorry, you can't have it. And the show's never been off. You know, if, if there'd been a cut-off point in uh, 2001, in the last uh, three specials, maybe four, um, and I hadn't done the spin-off series The Green Green Grass, you know, if we had to stop there and then it hadn't seen it in there, then maybe it would have faded. But he hasn't, because it's on every day. It's on gold and different things like that. But you just kind of touched mm. on um, the fact you're in Benidorm now. Yeah. And I, I absolutely love Benidorm. Um, but how did you get that part? Did, were you actually approached to, to come on board? Did you have to audition? How did that process work? Well, it, uh, it really was... Um, it was written by my name, Darren Lee. Um, and uh, Darren actually wrote an episode of The Green Green Grass and uh, a couple of other bits in that uh, series. So 
I sort of knew not that well, not personally at all. And uh, I suddenly he got up, he asked me to come do a couple of episodes of uh, Benidorm. And this was three or four years ago, and, and I couldn't do it. I was out of way. So and then he asked again, again, for some reason I couldn't do it. I could do something else. And then finally, I did uh, a couple of episodes. Of it. And, uh, and then the next series, uh, I was asked to do another couple of episodes. And then uh, he said, do you want to do the whole of this? And I went, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> so I just spent, you know, the beginning of the year, well, March to July, I was in Benedict doing uh, nine episodes of Marcy. Wow. And um, is there going to be any romance with uh, Mr. Joyce Temple Savage? Well, I can't <laughs> possibly, couldn't possibly comment. I mean, he's... Uh, He's besotted with her, you know, and she's. I think I think uh, he's got something she likes, you know, what it is I can't imagine. But um, she's resisting it. Uh, but at the beginning of the next series, I mean, you, you must watch it because uh, he's proposed to her, and uh, I think she might might be accepted, but uh, but she might not. Have you seen a change in, in the character? Because at first you were you were the con man, um, yeah. trying to rip off Clive into buying one of the um, yes, one right. of the apartments. Yeah. And, but then then you kind of seen a softer side when you yes. fell for the choice, which was a was a difference to the character. Yeah, it's, be, it's become a bit of a problem. Yeah. One, two, sure. one, two. But it's uh, but it's a smashing, smashing play, very different for me. Yeah, really. Um, one, two, Jack. Uh, that's that's yeah, but as I say, we meet a lot of people having a jolly time in bed yeah. and, uh, and mostly <laughs> I bet you hear the laughs every time you walk into a into a place. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Lots of sheep all over the place, you know. And in regards to the Green Green Grass, obviously when the Only Falls and Horses, the, the show um, finished in 2001, did you ever anticipate that John was going to come up to you um, and say, I've got something else for you now? No, no, I have no idea at all. It was just a complete surprise how when it came to it. But, and the whole spin-off series you know, was inspired by, by the fact that uh, Karen and I moved back to London. After, what was that? Um, <coughs> after uh, about 30 or 40 years living in London, and we moved to Herefordshire, and we had to put parts together. And the guys from Early Falls came, including John Summer, and he saw me suddenly completely out of context. You know, it's sort of, some state of use of the Lord of the Manor role, you know, we built a big old house, which Carol's got a connection to. It didn't I didn't intend to do that at all. But suddenly uh, there, was, there was this place. We were trying to keep this, this uh, house together. <coughs> Created <coughs> garden. So all these people came along. And this, and George and George saw it. So what would have been the problem with the boys? And he couldn't think of why boys should leave them. There had to be a logical reason. Did you understand? And he said to me, I can understand why you left. But why the boys left? And why would Marley agree to it? Too? So it wasn't until um, after about two years they um, uh, we saw an episode of the uh, uh, the only things was horse was just about. That's it. So he's grassed him up and he's on the run. That's that was the logic. Yeah. And uh, so so if we had moved out, I probably would never have happened. Yeah. And you know, I absolutely love the series. One of my favourite episodes is when um, Marley decides she's going to start giving voice in a massage. <laughs> the incident where she does it to your left, the dog takes the cover off yeah, you, yeah. standing at the window. And also the uh, scene the um, portrait. Oh, yes, yeah, so it's yeah. situating my, my, my best features, yes. Yeah. One eye looking at it one way, yeah. Yeah. Right looking at it. yes, that's right. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yes, well, they, uh, they were very nice to me uh, from the Green Green Grass. Well, the end of it, they presented it to me. Right, <laughs> the nice went, oh, this is really nice. I wonder what this is. <laughs> Have you still got that? Oh, no, 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 it's just so it's just a piece of luck, you know, and that's how it happens. And, uh, we had a great four or five years. 
So the question just marches on, and that's a lot of what this show is about. So you see the boys. And does voicing based on something that you need? Do you kind of look at some of the things that's what I want voicing to be part of? No, it is something uh, it actually came from um, John Sunday's first big series, which was called Citizen Smith, yeah. and Rob Lee on the engine. And I was asked by um, the director producer of Michael Gray Duck to play uh, a policeman. Uh, giving evidence from a dead policeman. And uh, I played all the lot of people. And, uh, I just thought I must do something different. And I remember this guy who's been in a park in the south of London. And uh, he had this curious about it why he didn't do this and so he, and he fascinated me right there, you know, many times maybe. Yeah. So I thought I'd just invest the police with that uh, sort of yeah. that's some of those characteristics. And uh, John Sullivan said he said I really like what we've done with that, I'm gonna try and use it again. Yeah. Thank you very much, but I didn't think any more of it. But uh, about a year later, I think it was also and so said, well, I can't be a second in the car, instead. So I said, uh, Bono de Hooch? <laughs> yeah, so I'll help you out, John, I know if I'm wrong. And I bet no one anticipated the show to become the, the kind of national treasure that it become because. It doesn't matter what generation, everyone knows the show, everyone can talk about episodes, scenes, comments. It's just because, I, I, can't, I can't, can't think of another show that's anywhere on that level. No, I can't. I mean, it, is, really a, it is a phenomenon. Uh, I mean, and uh, the fact that it crosses every generation, and the young people like yourself. I can, because we always knew our contemporaries. Still like it, because we didn't know who it was. But the fact that it reaches every following generation is extraordinary because they keep getting intro introducing their children to them. and then their children grow up have their own children and they get introduced to it. It's amazing. And I, th I think you're right, I think it is it's an exception. Uh, and you've obviously got Perry who runs the Appreciation Society and they put on a convention every year and hundreds and hundreds of fans and it's amazing to see that everyone turns out. I've been to one I met in uh, 2009. Um, Years and years ago, I met you there. Oh, yes, prehistory practice. That was yeah. Bristol. Bristol! Uh, that's where the uh, convention was. Yeah. Amazing. It was so nice to see um, everyone there, and obviously you were there with Sue. Yeah. But what you and Sue have such a special on the screen um, relationship. So, would you say there's a secret in kind of creating that? Because you have a lot of couples just on the TV shows, and it just you and Marlene have become, everyone knows Boise and Marlene. So, is there yeah. a secret to create such a special relationship? Well, you see, I've got a theory about women. <laughs> if you want to get on with women, you have to like them. But if you like women, which I always have done, they tend to pick up on that. And so they tend to like you You know, <laughs> I don't know, honestly, I do. I, I, I enjoy the company of women. And, I always have to, um, and uh, I suppose you, know, you get a bit flirty or something. You know, and, uh, and, you, and you elicit a response. If you don't elicit a response, you, well, you don't do it. Do you flirt? You flirt a bit Marlene on the. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course, yeah. And she was not averse to flirting back. <laughs> no, we just get on as you know. It's the uh, um, um, luckiest thing in the world, really, because you know if somebody's trying not to play opposite. You just hope you're going to get on. Yeah. And uh, we did. We've been friends ever since. And still are. And, uh, still sort of keep in touch and we've been on holidays together uh, with our respective husbands and wives, you understand? <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, uh, Sue's husband is a great friend of ours as well. Yeah, yeah. he's a great yeah. team. Yeah. So. And you know, with, uh, with uh, <laughs> the whole Joyce thing, I mean, it's slightly different, it's very different to that. But, uh, but you know, you, you've got to have that chemistry. Yeah. Uh, it works very well, and you, it's so nice to see you on um, TV together, and with the bicker in, and the fact you rip into her, she rips into you, but it works, and everyone yeah, yeah. loves it. Yeah, um, growing up, did you always know you wanted to be an actor? Yeah. Did you come from a, a, a like, were your family into that industry, or was it just yourself? No, really, yeah, my mother did a bit of uh, amateur work. Um, in fact, here in Bath, she, um, she was a sort of unofficial uh, assistant stage manager at uh, the assembly rooms in the park. But it was uh, the war came, the theatre closed, and everything closed. 
you know, the whole threat of invasion and everything got transferred. When she met my father here and he was in the Admiralty. And, um, and then the Admiralty got transferred from Bath to London. And um, I, I was born in the first year of their marriage and um, obviously I had no choice but I went with them to London. So I actually was only here for about 20 minutes. Not like during the war. <laughs> yeah, during the war. Oh, that's right. But but she uh, so so she um, she she might die professionally. No, no, no. no. She, was but she couldn't at that time because uh, there's just that uh, time of life where uh, she went to the garden. And um, yeah, uh, and then they finished up in Surrey, but she did did a bit of lantern work in the lantern. So I suppose I picked. I, my brother Ross used to say rather charmingly. Any talent my son's got, he's got from me. <laughs> which was, which is probably true. I don't know. But, but no, she obviously had that thing about it. Yeah. She, she would have been, yeah, she was quite a, quite a large actress, shall we say. Of the old school. He's not a surprise. She was, uh, yeah, she was. She played Queen Elizabeth. Elizabeth I. I remember one time I came to see her. She was in the conference. It was fantastic. <coughs> but very over the top. Um, so I, I don't know what would have happened. She might have carried on, but she met my father and had me and said that was the end of that. And then you carried on the acting. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we, now we know you love your fans, and we've got some questions from the fans on the Appreciation Society. If we can go through um, some in the next kind of couple of minutes and get as many answers yeah. as we can. Yeah, okay. um, so Jessica Jane Lawrence says, are you friends with any of the cast members in real life? And obviously you just mentioned Sue. Sue certainly, yes. Uh, Paul Barber played Denzel. Um, he's at uh, all the conventions and uh, we, see, we see each other now and again. Um, but fun. I see the, the girls, uh, Raquel and Cassandra, Gwyneth Strong and Tessa Pete Jones. And she, uh, they turn up at the conventions as well, so uh, we see them. Um, and strangely, in uh, Benidorm, I saw uh, Patrick Knight, who was uh, yes. Greg Dick Pierce. DJ. Yes, he was, he was DJing and he was, he was trying to do a show of his own out there. And I think he's. Um, He's had a bit of a problem because he he went to Thailand and he was teaching English there and he met someone who married them and had a child. But then he's run up against sort of immigration problems. So I think he's having a few. Right? And uh, the last I <coughs> the last I saw, he was at this last convention. Um, so I've seen a bit of him. Um, I used to see a lot of uh, Kenny McDonald played my Fisher. Um, of Nate's head, but unfortunately he died tragically in about 2000. I used to see Roger, Roy Pat, who played Trigger, but he's passed away as well. So I can't believe it. Just, uh, you know, I've uh, got a, a picture of a montage of stuff in the show there. There's a picture of us doing, doing any guitars and singing along together when we were doing the show. And, um, it's, it's, it's awful, really, to, yeah. to see it, you know, because uh, 15 years of your life, you know, and, uh, and uh, it changed all our lives. That show. Yeah. Everybody's life has changed, really. Uh, the next question I ask, <laughs> I like it, says uh, Stephen Blood, can you still smell onions? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no. <laughs> uh, we've got Rob Paul, um, will you be opening? Will I be opening? <laughs> opening what? <laughs> Will you be opening the Shrewsbury Winter Food Festival this year? Oh, I don't know if I'm opening it. I'll be there. I'll be there. I'll be at um, Shrewsbury, yes, and also Ludlow, because they're quite near where I live, because I live in Herefordshire now. Um, but um, I don't know if I'm opening it. I haven't been asked to it before, so uh, pretty cold this time. And now um, a family member has, of mine has actually asked her, Andy Mayer, has said, do you really laugh like that? No. <laughs> Would you? I don't know, I, I like know. it. I'm trying to learn it myself, but it's very hard to... Well, you know, it's just hard. I mean, it was a complete accident and all that, because uh, I just said, the script said, you know, Boise laugh and his own jokes, and um, I just did this laugh that I remembered from a woman, actually, strangely, in, in a pub in South West London. Yeah, that's what she's going like laugh. <laughs> and I always remembered it, so I just did it. And everybody laughed and said, keep it in. Can so that's how it happened. Is it something you can teach? Oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't teach anybody, no. Yeah. So, 
Stephen Goodyear says, um, thanks for creating one of the best characters on television. Um, and then we've got, you just answered one of the next questions that someone had for you as well, which is, who inspired um, the laugh? <laughs> now, I've got a game for you, because mm -hmm. you seem to know a lot about the show. You've been to a lot of conventions, so I've got a list of actors. So I'm going to tell you the actor's name, and you need to tell me what character, what minor characters they played on Only Fools and Horses. Oh, God. <laughs> so the first one is Christopher Mitchell. Christopher Mitchell. No idea. He played PC Terry Hoskins. Oh, Chris. Chris. Is that, what's his name? Oh, I remember. Oh, no, yeah, in the Tahlenberg. That's right. That's right. Oh, God. What's his name? Mitchell. And then we've got Colin Jevons. <coughs> Colin Jevons, uh, uh, yes, did he play some some accountant or lawyer? Lawyer, sorry, yeah, I'm lawyer. In uh, what episode is that? Hole, hole in one. Hole in one, yeah. Yeah, you, you see some of these people appear in episodes I wasn't in. I wasn't in any episode, so. That was good that you've got that. That's going to be. I, next one we've got is Sarah Duncan. Sarah Duncan. I'm terribly sorry, Sarah. <laughs> Lady Did Victoria. Lady Victoria. Royal Flush. Royal Flush, I wasn't in that. So. I'm making this harder. Diane Langton. Diane Langton? Uh, no, I don't know. June Snow. I know the, I know the name very June well. June Snow. Uh, yeah. One of the old flames of Del Boy. Ah, uh, well, you see, I wasn't interested in Del Boy. So <laughs> I'd be interested in that, you know. Uh, Wonder Bedford. Wonder Bedford, oh, uh, yes, this was. Uh, this is Cassandra's mum. Yeah. Do, you're doing what? New Pamela, 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 was it? That's so, right. It was Pamela, Pamela, yes, yeah. Yeah, strangely, I saw um, something I have seen, uh, a bit of Dennis Lill, who played her dad, Ben yeah. Allen. In fact, I saw him at the last convention, and uh, I've seen him now and again. Good, yeah, great guy. Um, so that's right, yes, Wanda, but the, yes, and Wanda, Wanda, was, uh, Wanda was part of that. Yes, that's right, that's the mum and dad of Cassandra again. What about <coughs> Nula Conwell? Oh, Nula was barmaid. That's right. And who, what was the barmaid's name? Nula, what was your name? <laughs> I can't remember. Nula. I can't remember your name. It's very it's confusing because there are about three or four different barmaids. So oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, go on. Maury. Now the last one for you, I think you're going to definitely get this, is Nick Stringer. Oh, Nick Stringer, yes, yes. The, uh, <laughs> What's I remember the episode, the first one I did, Go West Young Man, and uh, he finished up with the, um, he finished up with a car, didn't he? That's right. He finished up with, I think he's the only actor to have been in the series twice, different parts. Yeah. Because he was, what's the name of the character? Because Del was going to Australia. That's right. Okay. And, uh, I was just seeing about was he wearing a wig or not? Yeah. And uh, Jumbo Mills. Jumbo, Jumbo Mills. Yes. yes, that's right. I remember Boyce said, uh, 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 I got a tenor saying he's wearing a syrup. <laughs> <laughs> syrup of fig. Wig. Get it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jumbo Mills, that's right, yes. Yes, I've seen, I've seen him a couple of times too. Yeah. It's good, guy, great guy, yeah. Well, it's great to, to have you on the Cornwall channel. I know Cornwall is somewhere you like, um, and you've you've been on the Cornwall channel before. And I know you do a lot of stuff for the RNLI as well. You, you're a big supporter. Yeah, we collect uh, we collect the RNLI, and uh, I've got a connection with the uh, the lizard yeah. uh, lifeboat there because uh, my wife and I went to uh, <laughs> went to see it one time, and um, and uh, I, I had a, a birthday. I know it's sort of a secret, secret birthday thing, and uh, we went down to Cornwall and we met a couple of friends who I, I didn't know were going to turn up for dinner, which was great. But then, strangely, we were going, you know, out towards the Lizard Night Boat, and I thought, what are we going out here for? A spectacular part of the world, of course. But the whole crew was out there waiting for me, and uh, <laughs> the coxswain said, well, it's lucky you're here, John, you said, because we've got an exercise today, a bit short of crew. <laughs> Would you like to join us? <laughs> and I went, what? And, uh, and this all came because um, I'd always wanted to go down the slipway on a lifeboat, splashing in the ocean, ever since I was a kid. And she'd raised the whole thing, and, and off we went in the lizard lifeboat. 
And luckily, it was quite a calm day. <laughs> but it's uh, and I got all I got all the kids on, all the all togged up with the helmet and everything. And of course, they put me on the back of the boat because they knew there was going to be a big splash and I'd get water all up the day. <laughs> Nevertheless, I got to drive the thing, and um, I thought for a moment they were winding me and they were winding me up. So, yeah, um, but part of the exercise is, is a rescue, you see, John. And we're looking for someone to jump into the ocean and be rescued. And I'm going, what? <laughs> what? But no, luckily it wasn't me. What but, you? but it's fantastic. And I, you know, I've collected, I've got, I take a collection, sit around wherever I go. And if people want a picture, you know, just a selfie, or something, I say, just put some money in the box. And, and then people are so generous, raise an awful lot of money. So it's great. Well, so, so I'm kind of a West Country boy, really. I had to go to London a few years, but uh, my mother came from Somerset, you know, and uh, my wife comes from Dawson, where we've just been. And uh, even more west, of course, is Cornwall. And it's a different tribe of people. <laughs> the Tamar River. Huh? But uh, no, fantastic part of the world. And uh, when we were going to leave London, we always knew we were going to go west. Yeah. So, uh, we west. went west, but we went to the Midlands instead. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Well, John, thank you so much for joining us on the Cornwall Show. It's been amazing talking to you, and I actually get to see you face to face in interviews. It's been an absolute pleasure. So thank, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Very thank much. you.